I see some faces that look happy and some others they say yes but their face doesn't show it. <laughs> if I pronounce the word happiness, what is the picture that comes to your mind? A vacation, something you don't, you wish you would have or something like this. What would make you happy? Today or soon? Where to find lasting happiness? Is it possible to find happiness? A happiness that, that remains and everything. Hallelujah. Proverb 15, 15 says, all the days of the oppressed are wretched or miserable or the depressed. It's the same word, oppressed, depressed, poor, the one that is afflicted are miserable. But the cheerful heart has a continual feast. And there's a big difference here. You have a depressed person and to the person depressed, Every day is miserable. Even if it would be great to someone else, to that person, there's always reason to complain. There's always reason to find something dark and, and uh, that is uh, unpleasant or something. But for the cheerful heart, every little pleasure is just is great. It's exciting. It's a reason to, to rejoice and be thankful for everything. So you have two kinds of people, basically. Uh, even here in the church, we, we, we may uh, think of some people who are uh, more of the grumbler type and some who are like the cheerful type. I know that uh, Sister B is a very cheerful person. If you, if you know her, uh, and she's a very positive person, I never heard her speak against someone and if there is a reason that we could complain about something, she will, in the midst of all this, find something positive to say. So I, I, I like that. Every person desires true happiness. You, you want that, I want that. I, I know many times I was on the train in China of a long journey in the past, and people are talking like where I'm from. I'm from Canada. Oh, Canada, good, good. I says, I says, oh, China, good, good also, you know. We know why? Because basically you and I, we want the same thing. You want your children to be happy. I want my children to be happy. We want basically the same thing as, as human beings. So... Anyway, there are two kinds of happiness, and uh, we will talk about that this morning. But uh, not long ago, I came into an article on South China Morning Post that says something about uh, Hong Kong young people, and we have it on the next, next slide. Um, and it talks about 52% of the uh, respondents in Hong Kong were unhappy. 52. And if you look at the comments that I posted just uh, beside here from this article, um, it's a survey made in 10 regions in Asia. And uh, the most unhappy of 1,000 over 100 people surveyed in Asia, uh, the Hong Kong makes the third most unhappy people. Only one percent of the youth see that the government does what the government does makes them happy, and we, we, see, we see that at the moment this week. Good relationships with family and friends are the top reason that makes them happy. Good health and getting a pay rise are also among the top three reasons that help them get a good mood. Would you be in a good mood if your employers would give you a pay rise, a promise of a pay, pay rise? Yeah. Financial stress causes the most emotional anxiety. This morning I was talking with, uh, with Tom, and if you want to talk with him after the service concerning the events, he's been part of it. And because of his sign and his concerns for the students that he has, he's been interviewed many, many times. And because he's been interviewed, uh, he's been on TV, in the newspaper, his photo was posted, a lot of students and a lot of people came to talk with him about this. And uh, one of the things he, he told me is exactly 
the last point here, financial stress. They really are concerned about their future. After graduation, what kind of job? They are very afraid that they will get a poor salary and that they will be poor. And they wonder uh, how life in Hong Kong will be after they graduate. And it is uh, like a very, very serious concern. Uh, Debts, reduction in salary cited at the top two sources of unhappiness. So we have these realities in our lives right here in our face here in Hong Kong. And we have basically uh, s different kinds of happiness. Uh, a psychologist was saying, uh, when people come to my office to seek counseling, the, he's asking them, why, why have you come to counseling? And everybody says, I just want to be happy. Whatever the, the, the situation they have. If I can just find the right person and get married, then I will be happy. If I could get the new house or that new job, if I just could get pregnant and have a baby, if I could quit my job and stay home with my kids, if I could get early retirement, if I could move closer to my family and have help, if I could lose 15 pounds, <laughs> if I could travel more, if I could afford to retire and all of this. And when we get these things, what, how do we feel? We feel happy, we feel happy for a while. And that's the point where I want to go this morning, because that kind of happiness is kind of a passing emotional state. When the circumstances are just right, things are pleasant, we don't have a lot of troubles in our life, and, but we know that this kind of situation will not last and everything. Um, circumstances change in our lives. So when the circumstances change, happiness, that kind of happiness that was based on a positive environment may fade away also. So. You know, even in ideal circumstances, if you think about that, like your life is good, everything's fine, you know, in your life you have a good marriage, you know, and everything, the, the trouble can be in your heart. You still can have our external, very positive environment and still be very much troubled in your heart. You may be concerned, you have a good marriage, your husband and wife, you are happy, but you may have trouble finance, you may have trouble with the children, you may have trouble with your health and be very much troubled even though you have parts of your life that is very, very positive. In psychology, there is one, one theory that is of happiness that is called the hedonic treadmill. And we have it on the following slide. And it is uh, expressed in this way. The value uh, or the thrill of a new pleasure wears over time. And basically what, what it says is like most of our people in this theory of happiness, we, we, all of us, we all have like kind of a medium state or an average or a set state of happiness. And then we go through positive event or negative event and our feeling goes up or goes down. But it, uh, with time, it goes back to the set uh, happiness level that we most of the time has. For instance, you win the lottery. Yay! Or you, you, you win the, the competitions, the gold medal. Yay! Okay? And then after you get the trophy, you go back <coughs> home. So what? What's next? You know, and everything. Or, or you, you, you have a disease or something goes wrong in your life and it, things horrible happens and you get really depressed. But after time, you, your heart gets healed and it, then it goes back there. So that's the treadmill theory of, of happiness. Uh, you know, the more feel good we have, the more we need to achieve the same level of things to get the same level of happiness. It's like an addiction. Before one glass of wine make you feel good, now maybe you need three glasses instead. So something like that, if you, of course, if you drink wine, knowing that most of you don't uh, drink wine. If you make more money, you will have more expectation, your lifestyle will change, you will get used, so after a while there will be no permanent gain of happiness. So these things don't really work well because it returns to the basic uh, level of happiness that uh, we have had. Amen? So researchers have a hard time defining 
what is it really happiness? How do we define happiness? And there is a field of study called positive psychology. I'm sorry I'm not talking uh, only about psychology today, but it's something that concerns us. You know, we are body, soul, and spirit. And soul, the, the soul is our psychological part of our man. The Bible talks that there are two kinds of men, the spiritual man and the soulish man, or the psychological man, it's called the uh, psychitos, that, that this is the, the man, the man according to the uh, psychology. So in this field of positive psychology, it, it comes like this. We make choices because we think we, it, these choices will make us feel good in the future. So th that's how we make, in the positive uh, psychology theory, we make uh, our choices based on what we think will bring happiness into our life. Isn't that right? If you think about it, that's how we, we base a lot of our decisions, where we go for vacations, the kind of dream house that we have in mind, uh, you know, we, the promotions that we seek after, the purpose why we do certain things, and we, you know, even about marriage and everything. So we, we, we make the decision that we think will make us feel good in the future. I'm going to marry him because he will make me happy. That's the, that's the basic things. I'm going to pay for this vacation because on this vacation we will have so much fun. So we are making choices on that. So, but here, again, the goal of this uh, positive psychology is feel good. That, that's the goal. It's like the goal of life. It becomes a, a, an objective or a reason to live or a motivation into our lives. So how do we explain then, and now we are moving into a different uh, aspect, how do we explain then that some people choose things that are, aren't always pleasurable? Many people will choose for their life things that are not really pleasurable or pleasant. An example, uh, caring for uh, aging parents that are uh, sick or unable to care for. So people will make a choice. That, is the, that will become another motivation factor for them. Does that mean that these people will be less happy? than the one that plans the good vacation and plan, you know, for the self-satisfaction and pleasure. They are choosing something that is unpleasant, something that is going to be harder, something that will demand a lot of sacrifices and everything. So why do people make this kind of sacrifice? Why a woman will uh, would choose to maybe quit her job and a, and a good career to stay home with the children, to raise our children at home. Why do people make this kind of a, a decisions? It's very easy in a way to answer. First of all, it's because we love these people. We love them. We love our children. We love our aging parents. Because they need help. We see that they need help. Somebody needs to do something about it, and because it matters, because it is important that something is being done, and because these people who make this kind of decision believe that this is the right thing to do. So there's another level of motivations and doing uh, choices in life that are not based on self-seeking to be happy, but on doing something for another uh, reason. What they are doing, and that's another point here, what they are doing is that they are choosing meaning over pleasure or happiness. There's two, two things that you can choose to motivate your life or to equip your life and to render your life filled with happiness and contentment. One is to seek pleasure or something that will be pleasant and uh, you, you plan your decisions on that like we have said and you want to go up in the peak of happiness and, and because it's so much fun to be there. Or you can choose meaning over happiness, which does not necessarily will bring you a peak of that kind of happiness. But in doing so, you know, when people choose hap uh, meaning over happiness, they also find happiness but another form of happiness. And that's something that to think about because in the midst of sacrifice, a soldier 
decides to go and fight for the freedom of his family, of his country, and he goes to the front where it's going to be dangerous, he makes a choice that is very dangerous for his life. But he is sacrificing himself for a higher purpose, and it, it makes him have a feeling of importance, uh, you know, my life counts for something, I'm doing something good for others, I'm doing what is right, I should be courageous, I should be doing that. My sister has a very handicapped daughter, my niece. She's 30-some years old now, my niece, and she's really, really handicapped. And my sister lives, has lived her life around her just to make her happy. But if I look at my sister, do I see her unhappy, frustrated, or you know, disappointed with her life? No, her life is filled with joy. She is doing, she is loving her daughter, she is making the, the life of her daughter a comfortable life, a, a life of love, of dignity, of respect, and I admire my sister for that. But you see, the, the, the basis of her happiness is not on, on self. I hope that my spiritual life will not be about feeling good only. Because we all, in a way, seek that. And it is normal, it's part of our human nature. The, the seeking of the, the good feeling and the good life and everything is part of our society. It's part of each one of us. But I pray that my spiritual life will be more elevated than that. There will be something deeper and something that has more value than just seeking that. But rather my life and my decision would be uh, based on responding to God's life, to God's love for me, to God's will for me. God loves me. It took me in the pit of, of drugs and a hopeless situation and he rescued me. I'm thankful for that. I want to serve God. I chose to serve God. I want to respond to his love for me. So is Christianity meant, is the message of the Bible meant to make us feel good? Because there's a lot of it uh, on YouTube, there's a lot of it everywhere. I want you to listen to a, a short video, and I don't want to point the finger to a person in particular, but there is a controversial video uh, on Facebook, on YouTube, everywhere, uh, about a message that Victoria Osteen uh, made to a massive congregation. It's the biggest church in America, one of the most influential church in, in the world, and all of this. And in this video, she talks to the congregation that when they worship God, they're not really doing it for God. You should do it for yourself. And she will just share the, and listen to what, what the message is. Is this teaching conform to God's to God's thinking? No, it's not. What is God's pleasure for you? What is the what does the Bible declares to be make God happy really? Because she says if you worship for yourself, make yourself feel good when you're really happy. You know, when you live for yourself and God, you, you live in prosperity and you prosper, God is really happy for you. Whether you are Christian or not Christian, and there's no sinfulness, there's no repentance in that message or whatever. It just, just, God just wants to pour out his blessing on That's all. That's all what he cares for. So when you get rich, when you get, you know, you, God is so happy for you, you know. So is that what the Bible says? Is that the message? Is that the reason why Jesus Christ died on the cross? No. God's pleasure is that for all people that they will repent, that they will believe in Jesus Christ and be saved. And we find it in John 3.16. That's such a simple verse at the same time. God so loved the world. God so loved the world. God so loved the world that He wants all of you to get rich. That they have to be happy. He wants you to be happy. That's what God wants you. He wants you to be happy. So he sent Jesus to, 
tell you nice message and stories and feed the poor and give you bread and fish and you know so be happy this morning just like the song says don't worry be happy that's you know but for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whosoever believes in him should not but, oh there's that expl that express a problem here this perishing is a problem so that you should not perish but have eternal life so instead of perishing because of sin there's a salvation there this message can be preached I think the message that we that I was quoting before cannot be preached in Iraq it cannot be preached to the poor people it cannot be preached in many many contexts because it just doesn't work but the message of John 3.16 can be preached in Iraq, can be preached in Africa, can be preached in Europe, can be preached in Miami, can be preached in Mosul, it can be preached to the Kurds, it can be preached to the Muslim. This is the message of the Bible. The Christian life has never been about avoiding pain and maximizing pleasures. There's no writers, holy writers of the past that have ever uh, written like that. This is this is new. This is modern. This is a, a religion without God. This is a religion based on on man achievement, on man's uh, uh, humanity. James one two. Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles comes or your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. Troubles. Who wants trouble? Who wants to look at uh, uh, troubles for a great joy? You know. But the thing is that in Christianity we learn that we can grow and be transformed through adversity and trials more than with the feel-good uh, doctrines and the feel-good experience. There are the greatest stories of redemption, the greatest testimonies you've heard come from ashes. They come from broken lives and miserable situations and it, it shows the glory of God and the power of God to take ashes and bring like a uh, man and women of God and and missionaries out of it and everything as good as it feels to fall in love to get a new job to hold a new baby born to meet friends over coffee these are good moments but they are all what it is moments it's not lasting it is not lasting happiness feels good but it is temporary you and I we are made for something much more than that. You and I, we are made for eternity. We are made for eternity, and because of that, we have a greater purpose. And that's changed the way that we look, our worldview, and the sense of our, of our life. There is a happiness that comes from God, and this is the one that we ought to seek for. It is a happiness that lasts regardless of circumstances. It doesn't go up and down because of circumstances, you know. If you remember some of the pictures that you have seen during the uh, high end uh, typhoon in the Philippines, some of the places the, 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 the people were worshipping uh, knee deep in water and they had chairs and no roof and they were in the church and their place of worship but the, the, the flood water had not recessed yet but they were still there big smile in their face singing the, the, the song of praise to the Lord and rejoicing in the Lord I've been to so many places of hardship as a missionary and I have always always been you know an admiration how people can just laugh and joy be happy and express that that contentment and having almost no resource and everything I am this has been blessed me so much everywhere I've been and if you I've had this experience you you don't you know that what I'm talking about the happiness through Jesus is a contentment that fills you inside it's just there and you're just content with what God is doing even if your eyes would be filled with tears yeah there it would be the contentment so it's not really about circumstances up and down and uh, and, and blessing. We are made for eternity and we are made for a greater uh, purpose. But what robs us from this kind of happiness? There's something that takes it away from us because we don't experience, not all of us experience all the time this kind of God-given uh, happiness. So what robs us from this true happiness? 
Well, first of all, it's very hard to experience true happiness if we are filled with anxiety and you have no peace inside for whatever reason it is. And we know by experience, all of us in this room, that there are so many things in this world that makes us anxious, and, and whether it is in finance, health, family, or programs, staff pressures, and studies, and so on. So we waste a lot of time worrying. That's why there's so many scriptures and telling us, and Jesus tell us, don't worry, don't worry, no need to worry. You cannot change your circumstance by worrying. You cannot add a day to your life and worrying. Don't worry. And when Jesus, you know, you, you know the song, don't worry, be happy, you know? But there's no message. There's no substance. Why should I not worry? Well, what? Well, why? Just because I'm, you know, I'm, you know, brainwashing myself, like, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. <laughs> you know, no. When Jesus says, don't worry, he always connect that with himself, with his nature. And this morning we sang this most wonderful song and says, what a faithful God have I. And, you know, think about it. Your security, your peace of mind, your assurance about the future, your ability to be courageous and to go on with your life, it's all based on the faithfulness of God. Is that true? That's the security, that's our foundation, and that song really so blessed me uh, this morning because of that. So we, we feel anxious about, about, we worry about the past, we worry about the future, we worry to the left and to the right, and everything. But there is no need to be anxious for the future. You know why? Because after all, you cannot control your future. So you can worry as much as you want. You are not going. And sometimes I tell people as a pastor that worry. They are afraid of something that may happen to them. I says, wait. Wait until it happens. Don't worry before. You don't know if it's going to happen. Wait until the thing happens. You know? Covetousness. Greed and lust, bitterness and ungratefulness are terrible things that robs us from uh, this God-given happiness. It robs us from our peace of heart and it robs us of having harmonious relationships. You know, fear of not having enough. Uh, uh, envying what other people have. Being ungrateful is one of the worst things that we have, and it creates a, an atmosphere of competition, of jealousy, quarrels. James says, you want something, you cannot get in, and you're ready to get angry and to quarrel and fight. You have wrong motives. You, you want something that is not good for you. You want it too much that uh, you want it because you want to feel good of it. You, you want to be on the peak. But it's not going to bring it to you. It's going to take it away uh, from you. God knows the future, so trust in Him with your future. Another thing that robs you is sin under any form. Sins robs us from our peace. Sins brings guilt and shame and a burden and a slavery. Sin leaves our soul in darkness and it doesn't, we don't see the light at the end of the time. It brings depression. So I want to look with you briefly Psalm 103. Bless the Lord. O oh my soul, and forget not all his benefits. So there is benefits, you see. Forget not all his benefits. Who forgives all your iniquity. Who heals all your diseases. Who redeems your life from the pit. Who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy. Who satisfies you with good. So that your youth is renewed like the eagles. And this text, there is a list of five benefits that is mentioned. And these benefits, if you think about it and you bring it in the context of what we've been talking about this morning, these five benefits deals with all these things that rob us of our happiness. These, these happiness robbers, all of these five benefits have a, a solution for us, or they, they, they come and they, they, they will deal with these situations. Instead of becoming uh, grumpy complainers or depressed or something, we find here something very encouraging. Number one, forgive all of your sins. As we have said, forgiveness of sin is the most reality, important reality for true 
joy and happiness. This is the beginning, this is the foundation, this is where it starts. Forgiveness of sin. If you want true happiness, you must get forgiveness of sin. It's the most important reality, it's the foundation. Number two, who heals your diseases. Okay, not maybe not all of our diseases are going to be healed in, 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 in a way, but in this text we find the supernatural help, divine, uh, uh, divine help to your situation, to your sickness, to your, to your hardship and everything. You have access to God. He heals your diseases. You, you have a hope of having divine help. To, to, um, it reassures you, you know, when you are and feeling in your helplessness, when you are sick, when you are in your disease, when you are in your trouble, this God heals the, tr the broken heart. He heals your life. He heals your diseases. So there's a message of hope and to this aspect. Number three, who redeems your life from the pit. This is a very important statement and very interesting. Redeems here in the Old Testament, the word redeems, brings us back to the concept of the Redeemer. If you know the concept of the Redeemer, is that in a family, for instance, an example, if a, a woman becomes a widow, the, there is a kinsman Redeemer in the family. The, the closest in family rank will come and marry her, or give her a posterity, or take care of, of her. So the kinsman's redeem. If a farmer becomes very poor and he loses his land, the kinsman redeemer can redeem the land. He can buy it back and so that the land stays in the family as an inheritance forever and all this. So that's the, and, and here when it says that God uh, redeems your life from the pit, it, the word redeems is exactly bringing that, that concept. God takes the role or the part of the next of kin to you. That's what he does. So when you get in trouble, you're going to make bankrupt, and a spiritual bankruptcy, or whatever trouble you may kind of do. If you get in trouble of any kind, he is the next of kin. He is coming to your rescue. He is coming to deliver you. He is coming to purchase. He is coming you know, to, to pay you back, to bring you back and to help you. So that's the picture. God is your next of kin. He is really close to you. He is really concerned with you. And He is going to do some actions, intervene, interventions for you to help you so that you will not destroy your whole life and fall into the pit. And this one also is an important word when you put it together. It's a trap, it's danger, and it's corruptions. So in, 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 as you walk your Christian life and there's a lot of dangers, the enemy, Satan, temptation, sins, wrong decisions, that you know you get in trouble, you can mess up your life with your wrong decisions, but there's a kinsman redeemer alongside you who will prevent you, he will keep you from falling into this pit of destructions, he will prevent you, he will help you to overcome. Say amen for that because that's really exciting to know that. It will deliver you constantly from dangerous tragedies and this includes from going uh, to the grave. Number four, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy. This is wonderful. I believe that the greatest uh, factor for happiness is Love. Bell Rose said it so well. <laughs> love is the greatest factor for happiness. And here you have it over here. He crowns you with steadfast love and mercy. And crowns you here, uh, uh, crown, the word crown is encircled. He surrounds you. He enveloped you. He's in the front, he's in the back, he's on the, each side, under, above, and he is all over you. And it reminds me of Psalm 5, verse 12, that uh, he, he will surround us with his grace or with his favor as with a shield. We are surrounded with grace with mercies, with loving kindness uh, of God. This is, this is really, and it reminds me of Psalm 23, verse 6. Surely, 
goodness and mercy shall follow me every day of my life. That's exactly what it says. So in my life, when I walk with God every day, I should have this, this lasting happiness, this awareness that God loves me so much that it makes me feel good. I feel good. I feel good. Da -da 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 -da. <laughs> yes, I feel good. We are loved with everlasting love and we are showered day by day with the mercy of God. Amen? I'm accepted. I'm being loved. Hallelujah. Number five. Oh, it's so wonderful. It gets better and better. Who's, who needs a message like you've seen before, you heard before, when you have this most wonderful and positive message from God? And it deals with all the issues of our lives that come and rob us from, from happiness. And he, he tells us that how to be happy in, in, in a way here, with God on our side, who satisfied you with good. And satisfies is, is to be full, to be to 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 satiate, to to fill plenty abundantly of good things. Not like you will not lack. The Lord is my shepherd; I shall not want. This is so wonderful. God will God will make your heart content, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. This is also wonderful because you know we've been talking in this. Uh, uh, chart before you know that happiness goes up and down and up and down and again comes back to a certain level but here it says that with God because we're talking about lasting happiness not a temporal or a passing feeling but a lasting happiness and here you can find a security or a foundation for you pass uh, for your lasting happiness because it's like described like your youth your youth that never grows old. Your youth that is always renewed and stay young again. It's like the, the fountain of youth that you have found in God. It, it keeps you young. It keeps your energy level high. It keeps your motivation. It keeps your strength. It renew your strength when you hope upon Him. When the young people, uh, you know, they, they run and they, they get weary, says you wait upon the Lord and you will renew your, 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 your strength. You, you, you will exchange, He will come to you. And it, it talks of revival. It talks of your personal revival. Because none of us always live on the peak of our spiritual life, that we are always equal in our spiritual life, in our victory, in our you know, decision making and everything. So we, we also have ups and downs and everything. But God can bring continual renewal to your spiritual life always. And this is how we can maintain our level of happiness. Amen? Hallelujah. Whoa. And then, this text started with something very important. Do not forget all of His benefits. And this is very important tip. If you want to be happy in the Lord, do not forget May I never forget the good things that He does for me. The benefits, the acts of goodness of God. How God is faithful. And this is one of the key secrets of happiness. It's thanksgiving. Uh, thanksgiving. Gan and the sin. Like we are, well, my heart is filled with thanksgiving, with fullness. I count the blessing, I realize. You know, yesterday I was with my wife at home, and I, was, I had this message, and I was reading all sorts of things and thinking about uh, happiness and all of this. So I talked to her, and I told her, Brigitte, I'm happy. I'm a happy man. I'm content. I really, I am content, and I am grateful. I have a good life. I'm so happy. I wish you have a good life like mine. I wish so. Years ago, we both chose meaning over pleasure. We chose that. We, we were redeemed out of a sinful life, a life of darkness. We were redeemed. And we knew it. We experienced this salvation, this deliverance. Or what the, the benefits of the Lord, He forgave all of our sins, and we made a, a, a life choice. 
we chose together that our life would be to the glory of God, that we would serve the Lord. We chose meaning over self-seeking pleasure or a good life for ourselves. And we have lived, uh, Pastor Jennifer and some of you are the, the elders in the church, you will remember, we have lived in poverty. Maybe you, you don't realize that, but when I was a pastor in Canada, I lived under the level of poverty line a lot. I had four children. My salary was down there but I've never lacked of anything. I earn the minimum wage, and I had, at that time, maybe three children. I didn't have money for anything, but God provided. I chose meaning over pleasure, and it's been hard. One time, one of my daughters asked me the questions, Dad, why are we so poor? <laughs> and when we came here, there was no salary. They was living by faith, but we made that choice. And our life has been enriched. And when I will die, I will be like King David when he says, I'm satisfied with days. Long, you know, like satisfied. Just like, like it says, he satisfies my soul. And that is one of the benefits. This is, this is how I feel. I just want to let you know that. And I want to invite you to choose that kind of life so that God with God it's better everything is better with God amen, amen. would you stand please hallelujah hallelujah